I, will I would now like to move on to our round table. Uh, the title of the round table is to improve women's participation in uh, academia. And I'm very happy that uh, we have a very distinguished panel of uh, participants here. So first of all, felicitas. Thank you again. Agreed to stay in the panel and talk to us uh, about this important topic. Then we have Karen Scrivener. Uh, if you can move your, you know, move your hand, Karen is also an EPFL STI professor. We have Anna Foncuberta i Moral, professor also at EPFL in engineering in the uh, STI, and Alexandra Radenovic, right there, also a professor at EPFL in in engineering. So. I will uh, mediate this uh, round table and we will touch upon a number of uh, topics that I would like to, to talk with, the, with the, the panel. And uh, feel free, of course, I will start asking some questions, but feel free to ask questions via YouTube and also to any of you to jump in. So my first question is actually to Karen, who was actually one of the founder of the WISH Foundation in 2006. So what was your experience uh, as a female STEM professor, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics professor, when you first joined EPFL? If you can share some of the uh, experiences and feelings that you had as a professor at that time joining uh, an Institute of Technology. So, thank you, Louisa. Um, so, I joined uh, EPFL on 1st of March 2001, so almost exactly 20 years ago. And uh, I joined on 1st of March, and there was another full professor who joined then. And between the two of us, we doubled the number of full professors at <laughs> EPFL. <laughs> And even when you counted all the other grades, assistant professors, associate professors, visiting professors, titular professors, we were only around 10 or so. Um, so um, I guess this was, you know, for me, it was not that strange being in a minority because this is kind of how it's been most of my life. I, I work in uh, cement and concrete. And um, yeah, this is rather a man's world. So maybe I wasn't so aware of it. But I think with our small group of uh, women, women professors, little by little, we realized that this was um, a ridiculous situation and we really had to do something about it. Um, we had uh, over the years quite some meetings with the direction at EPFL. I think they were very sympathetic, but they said, well, you know, what can we do? How can we change that? And um, making the WISH Foundation was really a big step because I think this was an important event to, to bring outstanding women to the attention of the whole community at EPFL. Um, maybe I regret a bit that in the first few years, we had a lot of uh, undergraduates who attended the lectures and that seems to have died away in recent years. So if any undergraduates are, are listening, really I encourage you to attend our uh, Ern Hamburger events. They're also for you, not just for the, the staff and, and people and PhD students. And then, um, you know, we had a lot of debate over the years about proactive hiring. And um, one landmark there was we had this women only chair, which was sponsored by the Swiss Up Foundation, a foundation for higher education in Switzerland. And I was chair of this committee. And I, I mean, it was very uh, great experience. We had a lot of very, very talented women applying for this chair and we appointed one. But of course, then you realize, well, one extra chair, this is just a drop in the ocean. We really have to uh, go much further. And uh, I think then, you know, we started getting some people who were particularly the Dean of uh, Engineering at the time, uh, Dimitri Saltis was very much in the lead of um, 
you know, looking at how we could take proactive measures. But maybe there I, I will hand over to uh, Alexandra, who I think knows, uh, knows more about that. Okay, thank you so much, Karen, for sharing these uh, feelings <laughs> of uh, <laughs> being all alone out there, but things uh, have changed. And so here I would like, uh, if, uh, if possible, if you can uh, show my slides. Uh, I have a slide with some figures, you know, I, I cannot do without figures. So. These are EPFL statistics, and uh, here we see the number of females. So on the left side of the screen, you will see the tenure track assistant professor, what we call PATT, percentage of women. The statistics are from 2010 to 2020, actually. And this percentage went up from 25 to 29%, with some up and down. And the really interesting one is this uh, graph down here of associate professor and full professor, where we started at 7%, and we are now up in a fairly steady way to 16%. Okay, I will come back to this slide later because I would like then to compare this to instead the fact that when we look at bachelor students to master students, and to PhD students, the red lines are the female as percentage of the total number of students, we uh, probably have done a little bit less of an impact. So thank you for, for this. I would like to maybe go back to our panelists. And I would like to ask Alexandra, so what, what, did, you th what, what, what did it work? You know, what do you think were the most important policies that made these changes possible? Uh, I think uh, what worked the best is also the change of the culture. So I uh, joined the very young Institute of uh, Bioengineering, which is interdisciplinary uh, uh, faculty, uh, which had a, a very dynamic and a young uh, faculty. And as well, a uh, policy of EPFL to really include uh, uh, and actively uh, uh, employ PATTs. So we're going back to the uh, these initiatives to uh, hire uh, if uh, there is a candidate who is equally good as a male candidate. If, if the candidate is a female, then both candidates uh, were given an opportunity to pursue a tenure track uh, uh, path. Uh, so I think that changed. And I believe the numbers that show uh, that uh, you show down for associate and the full professors. So we all uh, entered uh, at the moment uh, at EPFL uh, from 2006, the policies to hire uh, mostly PATT professors. Uh, so that means that all these PATT, so tenure track professors, um, have been promoted, uh, have, have passed from the rank of the PATT to associate and then to the full professor. So these hiring initiatives didn't come at the uh, expense of the quality. So we see that the quality uh, was there. So uh, here I'm advocating for um, that positive and quotas, let, let, let's say, approach uh, that was uh, taken by uh, EPFL. So I think that was a really, really smart move. And with more female faculty on board, it was also easier um, to uh, change a culture in hiring committees. So I believe it was very difficult for Karen to be <laughs> on many search committees uh, and to serve on all uh, uh, boards and uh, meetings and uh, to be a mentor to everyone. Um, now, I think with more females, this is, uh, this is uh, easier. And as well, um, you know, uh, not being a single female in a room also helps. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what changed <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. This was uh, definitely, I'm sure, a game changer, you know, that uh, uh, not being the only uh, woman in a committee. I would like to go back to Felicitas, maybe for, for a question. For example, what did it mean to you, for example, to get the Erna Hamburger Prize? What was, did it have a meaning for you? Thank you. <laughs> 
Certainly, first of all, I was very, very honored that I received this prize and I really came with great pleasure to EPFL. But there were two other aspects for me which were associated with the Erna Hamburger Prize, which was associated with no, no other prize I got so far. This was, first of all, I visited EPFL and I could uh, visit labs and Karen uh, was, Scrivener was at that time the president. She was founding president of the Wish Foundation. So uh, she made it possible that I could uh, see some labs of my female colleagues there. And the other one was that I could have the possibility to have a discussion with the young students, undergraduate, graduate students, and also postdocs. So for the visit, I find it's also very important because I remember very well uh, uh, when Karen explained to me everything I need to know about uh, the importance of cement research. And I was absolutely fascinated what she did there, also to see her instruments. And also, you know, I was not aware of all these important aspects she was doing research on, on new materials to lower the CO2 emission. I think all this type of thing, also colleagues should be very much aware what other colleagues do. So this is a very nice aspect of the, of the prize. And the second one, equally important for me, was a very lively lunch discussion with a sandwich lunch. With, there were quite a few young uh, female students, uh, really undergraduate uh, postdocs, in the room. And we had a very lively and very open discussion. Uh, and I have a very, very good memory of, of this discussion with all, all of them. And uh, I think this was a very stimulating event, not only for me, but for the others and as well. And this type of events I consider extremely important now for EPFL because all the young people can come and exchange their ideas. They can include other topics which they which are very close to their heart and they have an, a very friendly environment to discuss it. And therefore I really encourage everyone to participate in those events which are organized by the Wish Foundation. Thank you, Felicitas. Uh, thank you for sharing this with us. Of course, we, we agree that the, not only presenting role models to our students, uh, be bachelor, master, or PhD, or postdoc, but also the opportunity to, to talk, to exchange ideas, and to talk like to a mentor is very is is an important part of the process of growing uh, confident women in in science so i would like to now pass to anna uh, von cuberta e moral uh, and i would like to ask you something about uh, uh, how we can keep on going and move forward so in particular I would like to ask you what you think about what is the role the funding agencies could play in uh, trying to improve uh, women participation in, 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 academic, uh, in academic environment. Can they just be an example or should they step a little further? What is your opinion? Thank you. This is a difficult question to answer in a few minutes. Uh, first, I'd like to take the chance to add something on what Alexandra said, uh, that hiring more female professors, it was not at the expense of quality. And for this, there is a measure of uh, the, so how successful professors are, especially when they are assistant professors, and this is how many ERC grants they get. And uh, the success rate in, uh, in Switzerland is about 7%. For female applicants is a bit below, it's 6.9. But at EPFL, uh, the success rate of the female assistant professors is much higher than the male professors. So you can derive the conclusions you want, but certainly these female professors contribute to the excellence of EPFL in their own way. So it was certainly uh, something very useful for EPFL too, to hire these female professors. Now going into the uh, agencies, um, uh, getting money for research, I mean, this is the way to, for you, when you have your own group, to excel and to bring your ideas further. It's very important to obtain funding. Now, uh, the agencies have a role to play because, you know, uh, they decide who gets the money. And for this, there are committees. And what I have experienced with the SNSF is that um, committees are always very well chosen. They're very balanced. The, co the discussions are very balanced. People uh, have the right to disagree and they find solutions in a very uh, uh, civilized way. And 
I, I suppose this is also the Swiss art of discussing, and um, <laughs> I, I really uh, appreciate this very much, and I've learned a lot from this. Uh, they have So SNF first plays a, a special care that when they have the success rates of male and female applicants, uh, they will not be uh, different. So if you have 30% uh, of female applicants, the success rate uh, so the, from the positive uh, evaluated uh, proposals, they should be about 30 that are from females. This is the first step. But they've gone a long ways from that. And, and they've now uh, all the committees have a minimum amount of female uh, uh, evaluators. And this is, uh, it has to represent the, the discipline, but a bit higher. So to just kind of uh, close the gap. And these rules are now into, into function. And I think this makes a big difference when proposals are discussed, that there is a balance uh, there. But also, they have created a lot of schemes to, to promote uh, uh, female scientists, especially the beginning. And one of the latest is the Prima, the Prima Fellowship, which is a way for early on female uh, candidates to really have their own group in an independent manner. And this is something that uh, agencies can do to sustain these uh, early talents. Yeah. Felicitas, maybe you want to say more things. Yeah, I would like to add, uh, actually, Anna, what you said. Uh, in my function at the Foundation Council, I can really uh, insist on telling that the theme of equal opportunity was a big one, and we had many discussions, in length discussion, what the Fonds National can do. You know, this is not a university, so they cannot do things what universities should do, but what they can do in making a fair funding and to help them also to, as I said, to win confidence that you can do as well as your male colleague. I think this is what I think. And they offer many different courses and so on. And uh, just to confirm, this is an issue which uh, Fonds National is very much aware also on the, on the political level of the Foundation Council. I think this is quite exceptional, Felicity, as you know, uh, the science landscape in other countries. I think not all the uh, agencies are like for national. I think this is quite exceptional. Huh? Yeah, we're doing well there. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable, right, that they, they put gender quotas. And, you know, the idea is to be an example for academic and other uh, institutions. I mean, I think this is a very interesting and courageous steps uh, and i'm sure it will pay off in the right way in any case so i would like to uh, move to the next part of the question which maybe if we can go back to the slides we have had some success but uh, we still there is still a leaky pipeline so in this graph what you can see is that the yellow is the percentage of men and the red is the percentage of uh, women. I put economics because, of course, I'm an economist, so I like to do that. And also in the science technique, uh, science technique in, in the lower panel. So as you can see, we still have differences. And uh, as you can see, we start with about 30% of PhD student, uh, women PhD students who graduate at EPFL, for example, and then we got the PhD level 30%, but when we go to associate and full professors, the statistics are go down to 16%. So there is still, we still lose women in this path. Thank you for, so I would like to go back to the panel. And the question here to everyone, what can we do to address this attrition? Any ideas? Any policies that you think could play an important role in avoiding losing women in the process when they start and to the process of getting to the end of, as full professor or associate professors. Uh, so, so maybe I can start. Uh, so we see that this leaky pipeline uh, kind of coincides with as well, uh, maybe decision of uh, some of the female to form a family. And uh, uh, I think this is a still a, a, a cultural problem in Switzerland with the daycares. And uh, I think uh, 
one of the programs that are also available at EPFL and nice funding opportunities that are here through Equal uh, Opportunity Office and the uh, um, Robert Nem Foundation um, are, uh, I think, a good ways of uh, uh, dealing with this, uh, uh, with this leaky pipeline. Uh, because at the point where um, students uh, uh, graduate, uh, um, they are de deciding on a career path and some stability that comes with the jobs in the industry and uh, other sectors and uh, judging between family stability and uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, less, uh, less certain academic paths um, uh, could play some role. Um, again, showing a more success stories, uh, such as the one we have seen with Felicitas uh, uh, a talk, could uh, also encourage um, students and the postdocs who are at this uh, turning point in their life. Certainly. I, I'm sure they will have a, a role. Karen. Yeah, maybe if I can come in. So, I mean, I really agree with uh, Alexandra. I think um, role models and, um, you know, um, showing that you can be successful and still have children. Uh, I'm very proud to say that actually I'm going to now be a grandmother in August. So, uh, <laughs> congratulations. I think it's the next step. Um, but I think also it's very uh, important we. Um, we really convince young girls that, um, you know, we need them now to save the world. You know, when I started working on cement and concrete, everybody thought, well, what on earth do women want to work on cement and concrete for? And now we come up with a new material which can reduce CO2 emissions by up to 40%. And if you, you know, because concrete is the most used material in the world, this has the possibility to save 1% of world CO2. Now, 1% may not sound a lot, but if 100 people can ha come up with ideas like that, then, then, you know, we have solved the problem. So, you know, I think in the past, a lot of uh, girls at school wanted to be things like doctors or, you know, thought this was a way to help people. I think we now have to make them see that, you know, we're facing these very difficult problems in the world and we need all the talent of everybody, of the, of the girls and the boys and the men and the women to, to solve this. So very good point. We should really bring them, catch them while, while they're young. Anna. Uh, just in symphony with what Karen said, uh, we also need to tell the, the young boys that it's fine if their girlfriend is, a, is better in something else uh, than them. They don't have to be the first and the strong and the things all the time, you know. The, the girlfriend can also save them from something. I think we have to do this together. If we have to save the world, we have to do it together and not only the guys. Absolutely. Felicitas, you wanted to say something? You are muted, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> I, well, I think it's very important that what I said at the very end, that everyone can contribute to improve the situation. And nobody should think the other person will do it for me, you know. Also, men, for instance, I appreciate a lot that your president, Martin Fetterly, is interested in today's event. So he was there in the morning. And I think all those things contribute to the awareness that only together, step by step, we improve the situation. And there's still a long way to go till we are reaching our goals. But we will get there, I'm confident about it. But it's really important that everyone feels concerned, male and female, in order to improve the overall society. Absolutely. And so I would like maybe to show the last slide that we, I have prepared. If you come, come back to the slide, here we go. And here I took the, the liberty to find data on uh, l'option spécifique à la maturité gymnasiale. These are data for Switzerland. And as you can see, so uh, red is math and physics, green is biology and chemistry, and uh, black is economics and law. And this is the percentage of uh, women, so women as percentage of the total. And, uh, here, I think, is where if we really want to have women 
coming up and uh, so we can uh, sort of consolidate our progresses, we really want to have more of these women coming to university, even in STEM type uh, uh, areas. So if we can go back to the panel, so what can we do to, to attract more of these of this young students and have them in this uh, option, in this more, you know, technical, mathematical, uh, engineering style option? Well, maybe also initiatives like what we do at WISH of giving them fellowships are useful. Any other ideas of what we could do to, to go to the students and uh, sort of encourage them to join us. If I'm allowed to say something politically incorrect. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, think, I think we have to reach to the high school and uh, school teachers. I think girls are very often told that, that if they're not good at math, oh, it's normal, don't worry about it. Um, I think we can encourage them already at early age in the school. And of course, EPFL does a lot to encourage them to bring them here. But uh, I think school teachers have really a big mission here. Yes, yeah. Felicitas. I, I really would like to support this uh, statement of Anna because I absolutely agree with you. We have to get them interested in school. And therefore, I also showed this example from, from CERN, what we did there. And I mean, it's also fun to be with these school kids and they're also young. You know, postdocs can help to communicate and so on. Because what you do with fish is you catch them when they're already there. But this is already too late. One has to motivate them before that they come to FFL and study engineering, science, physics, whatever. You know, and therefore we have a big job to do together with high school teachers to, to help them stimulating the curiosity. Children are curious about things, so just don't cut the curiosity out no, of there. Yeah, don't, don't cut their wings, right? Don't clip their, their, their wings in any way and encourage them to come to these uh, more technical maybe subjects because we really need everyone and especially women. Thank you very much. Now, I please stay still on board here yeah, because we would like to uh, get some questions from uh, the audience and uh, therefore I'm going to start reading the questions which come in. So the first question says, you mentioned school level being a crucial time to encourage STEM subjects. Were any of you discouraged at any stage by your teachers? Oops, Felicitas, go ahead. Yes, I was uh, highly discouraged to study physics. I mean, you have to know that I started 1970, so, you know, very many, many, many years ago. <laughs> so I was in Salzburg and, uh, you know, I was very good in music and my, we had this uh, at the last school, uh, last year of, uh, before the um, uh, fine, as we said, matura, apitur. Uh, we had this guy from who explained to us and we had some tests where we have talents for. So he uh, looked, then had individual discussion and he looked at my results and then he said, yes, clear for you, you're going to become a musician. And I said, how do you want to judge this? He said, yes, evident. Yes, I played instrument, I like music, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, where the hell in this questions I answered, you can see that I have my, a talent for music. <laughs> of course he couldn't. And then I said, so tell me the talents I have. And then he said, yeah, you know, I was a bit surprised that you seem to be very good in mathematics and physics. <laughs> and I said, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to study. <laughs> and he said, no, this is stupid. A girl, why should, you know, why should she study that? And I said, okay, the hell with you. I will do this. And, you know, they also told my parents, my father, you know, it's not, you know, why should she do this? If you will be anyhow marrying, having children. So I think we are now far away from that. But I also always therefore insist on saying, you, when you like to do something, do it. Go for it. You know, it's not always easy, but just go for it and then you will succeed. Okay, my story. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting story. 
Anybody wants to share other stories? Well, there are a lot of positive stories, right, of uh, us being encouraged at some point in time by, uh, <coughs> you know, a teacher or a professor or a role model who played a big role, which sort of eases us to the second question, which is some of you spoke about role models. Do any of you have a role model you looked up to? I know that Anna has one, <laughs> so I will let her share it with okay. us. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a female role model I, I, I met and followed, but uh, yeah, my postdoc advisor is an amazing person and uh, he has been and he's still my role model because he's uh, an amazing scientist and he also cares about, uh, you know, caring for the people too and uh, that we do things together and uh, we respect each other and we help each other make progress and be the best of ourselves. So uh, that's my role model. And yeah, he's a very big source of inspiration for me and all the alumni, all the alumni love him. Everybody loves him. It is important that yeah, the role model doesn't necessarily need to be a woman, right? It can be a man and they, still the message is, is, is good, is positive and uh, helpful in, in many ways. So let me ask uh, the last Question here, uh, quotas in evaluation bodies, are they useful? What is your feeling? Uh, the, the example for, that I, we, we touched upon earlier was for the SNSF, for the Swiss National Science Foundation, which explicitly put quotas uh, that, you know, were for, for the evaluation bodies and they put them into their law starting actually very recently. So what is your take? Uh, maybe I can start. Yes, um, Alexander. So uh, as, a, as a female scientist, I can also say that I am biased. So I can also be biased against the females. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, th this is something that I learned on the, on the course. And this is as, as well, I think, something that has to be uh, brought to everybody's attention, um, that these biases exist and that they are there and that we need to uh, make an effort to uh, fight them. And um, again, uh, when, when we are, when we are subconsciously biased, I think the quotas are also a good way of uh, uh, kind of uh, thinking about this bias and uh, uh, overcoming this. So a very a positive uh, impact by uh, changing the, the overall uh, environment in which decisions are taken, because at the end of the day, you know, hiring, uh, promoting committee, you know, are, are all uh, group, group and group activities. Any other suggestions from the panel on quotas? Is it a harsh measure? Should we wait for uh, quotas to be to come naturally? I don't. If, if we wait, uh, then it will never happen. I mean, I see it in price committees where you know people are proposed uh, spontaneously. And uh, the percentage of females that are proposed for prizes is always way below the percentage of female in the field. It's all the time the same. So, yeah. Felicitas. So, yeah, I, quotas per se, 50%, 50%, I'm not that much in favor, but I'm very much in favor that there is always enough percentage of female represented in a committee also, because Alexandra, really very happy that you said this, we should not think a priori that each female is always helping another female, okay? We have to be honest about that. It's a competition like in any other field. Uh, so it's also competition between females. But you have to have a sufficiently high number of females in this to, to smoothen out these biases, okay? And I think this is also individually, people are very different. So therefore, I'm really much in favor of having enough representative. And if it goes towards a quota, it's, it's also fine with me. But for me, it's the aspect of balance uh, is more important. Absolutely, yeah. Balance in, uh, in uh, committees, in any kind of deciding bodies where, you know, one person, a woman doesn't need to feel 
all by herself in in the committee because then there is no balance, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's very difficult to go against. So we have, I, I guess, one last question that pops up here. Uh, a survey found that women ask less questions than men during STEM seminars. What do you think about actively adding favorable condition? For example, having a woman ask the first question at the seminar. Any, any opinion? in your in your on this again, right. sorry to, to say to make again a statement but i think but if you you know i was a professor for so many years at ETH. when i saw that my i had many female phd students also which i was very happy about but when i see that they are not reacting as much as male i was you know encouraging them and then you can you know you can a bit uh, drive them in a certain direction. I think it's a bit up to the professor, the supervisor of the student, that they react correctly. And this can be a female professor who is doing this, but also male professors. So I think our male colleagues should also be, a, be more aware of this. And the more female they are, the more they are aware <laughs> that, you know, maybe you have to encourage them. And this comes back to where I'm convinced about they should be more confident in what they do and, you know, self-confidence, not exaggerating it, but, you know, just be there and say, yes, I also want to make a statement. I think this is very important that you teach them that they have all reasons to be self-confident, okay, in research. So I've, I, <clears throat> we have a question for you, Felicitas, but they, this time they wrote that this has to be the final question, so... <laughs> um, our students at the PFL will embark on scientific careers in the next few years. What would your message to them be? Well, our students, I didn't hear the whole... So thing. our students, at the, for our students who embark on scientific careers in the yeah. next few years, what would your message be for them? So they should go into... Uh, science or so keeping on in the academic or also in you know in industrial research if they are really convinced this is what they want to do i think to to be a scientist and and, and live for you know research you have to have your special you have to be a bit special character for that because it's not the job in an office or so so you have to be determined that this is really what you want to do and then i'm convinced you're convinced you want to do that, then you do everything to be successful. If you love what you do, you don't consider this work, but you consider it as just, I need to do that because it makes me happy. So this I would say, you need go, I mean, think about, you must be honest with yourself. This I always told my PhD student after, also after the PhD, what should they do next? I mean, you, it's up to you to decide. And if you want really something, then you do it very well. So go for it. So if they want, go for it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. So this brings this uh, round table to the conclusion. I would like to thank Felicita Spouse for her keynote and for kindly agreeing to be part of this panel. Thank you, Karen Scrivener, Anna von Kuberta Moral, and Alexandra Radenovic for sharing your thoughts, your opinion, and, uh, you know, for such an uh, interesting input to this roundtable. Thank you very much for your time. And at this point, I would like to thank everybody who followed us. And uh, we'll see you later. Thanks. <laughs>